Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I say good afternoon because that's what it is here for us in Washington, DC. My goodness, we have a lot of people here today. Thank you all so much for, for joining today. Um, I'm Ranger Jen. I am a ranger at the National Mall and Memorial Parks, and we're so excited to have you joining us for our uh, Lincoln Memorial 100 program today. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Yay, yes, please tell me where you're from and tell me uh, what grade you're in. If you're uh, joining us, you feel free to use the chat box. Um, I'm very happy to be here today with my friend Erin from the Trust for the National Mall. And I'm going to toss to her. Oh my gosh, I can't even keep track of people from all over. I saw Georgia, I saw Virginia, I see Alabama. I think I'm gonna get sick if I keep trying to read. My goodness, there's so many folks here. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, Aaron, let me talk to you and you can tell people a little about the trust and uh, about how we're gonna operate here today. Awesome, thanks so much, Jen. Welcome everybody. It's great to see names and um, grades from all over the country, welcome. So my name is Erin Plant. I'm a public engagement coordinator at the Trust for the National Mall, which is the primary nonpartisan philanthropic partner of the National Park Service here on the National Mall. That just means that we're friends who work together with the Park Service to preserve, restore, and enrich the National Mall. So as you might know, it's a very exciting year here on the Mall as we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial, which happened on May 30th in 1922. It is such a thrill to welcome you all here and be able to guide you on this virtual visit to the Lincoln Memorial. Whether this is your first visit to the Memorial and you plan on going in person in the future, or maybe you live here in DC and you've visited many times before, I'm sure you will all learn something new. Um, as we go through, please put all of your questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom, and then you can use the chat to share any comments or answer to any questions that Jen might raise throughout the program. I uh, will try to get to as many questions as we can, but there are a lot of you, so um, we might do a follow-up of this if you want to get some more time with Ranger Jen and all of her knowledge on the Lincoln. Um, if you enjoy today's session, it's going to be recorded and posted on our website. Um, nationalmall.org under the explore tab. There's a virtual classroom series um, that features um, sessions that we did. Um, Jen brought together rangers from all over the country to talk about the Lincoln Memorial and different elements of memorializing Lincoln. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Jen to get us started and just thank you again so much everyone for being here. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, this is such a big year for us at the Lincoln Memorial. I start with this really um, beautiful photo that was taken by one of my colleagues as the, the sun, was, sun was setting over the Lincoln Memorial. And um, today we're going to go over uh, a little of the history, a little bit of, of um, what makes this place significant, some of the things that have happened there. And uh, yes, indeed, if you have questions along the way, please put them in the Q&A box. We'd love to be able to answer as many as we can. Um, wow, so amazing. So many friends are joining us today. Um, I hope some of you have had a chance to come and see us out at the, the National Mall. And I guess I should start really quickly for those of you who aren't familiar with the term National Mall. It does, uh, it does kind of make you think about something else. Um, you might kind of be thinking about when you hear the word mall, the idea of going shopping, which is not exactly the kind of park that, that we work at here. The National Mall is this place in the middle of Washington, D.C. Um, the word mall used to mean this big open space, and I guess it still does. And we just use it to describe our park because look at all that green space out there. Um, that's why we are known as the National Mall. Sorry about that. Um, and so I show you this picture to give you a sense of where the Lincoln Memorial fits in, in, our, in our park. And I wonder if maybe some of you could give me an idea if you know where this picture was taken from. Anybody have any idea? We'd love it if the chat could stay kind of focused on what we're doing. There's a lot of folks in here today. Um, does anybody have an idea? Oh, I see some already. Yes, we have a lot of 
A lot of Washington monuments, excellent. Yes, if you said helicopter or you said airplane, um, those are some great guesses as well. The White House is a little bit over, about two blocks to, to our right as we're looking at this photo, but the Washington Monument which stands 555 feet, five and an eighth inches tall, has windows at the 500 foot level, and it lets us look out over this beautiful view of the National Mall. And as you look west, you see this Lincoln Memorial built uh, just over 100 years ago to honor President Lincoln. So there he is, the man that uh, this building is all about. I'm wondering if you all, seeing, seeing as there are some of you who are very into using our chat today, um, could give me some thoughts as to why it is our country would want to build a memorial to President Lincoln. What are some things that you might know about President Lincoln that would make you think, huh, 100 years ago, we should really build a building to honor him? Ending slavery, 16th president, Emancipation Proclamation, President during the Civil War. I see you all have some great knowledge already. Yes, he lived in Illinois. I don't know if that's the reason to build a memorial, but uh, yeah, you all have a lot of ideas. Courageous, ending slavery, tall, on the penny. I love it. Lots of great ideas. Thank you all so much for, for, for participating and joining in. Yes, so this memorial to President Lincoln, is going to be talked about soon after his, his tragic death in 1865. It's going to take a little while, though, before they figure out exactly what they want to do. There's different ideas, of course, when most of our memorials are, are talked about. There's usually some kind of committee that is created um, to help figure out how to memorialize someone. And um, the thing they would have to decide, I guess, with President Lincoln's memorial was where were they going to put it? So let me, uh, let me show you this old picture of the National Mall. I want to say this was about um, 1860, I feel like it's 1868-ish. It's, it's just past President Lincoln's time in Washington, DC. And we just were talking about the Washington Monument, which is the spot where we took that last photo from. Um, in this photo in the 1860s, the Washington Monument was only half finished. They, uh, they weren't able to have it all done at one time. It was built in two different phases. When you look at it today, you see it's two different colors. It reflects the two times that they worked on it. And so the second part of it won't be finished until the 1880s. However, the thing I really want to call your attention to in this photo is not so much the unfinished monument, but what you see behind it. You see an awful lot of water which if you have visited Washington DC today, you don't see that much water. You may have noticed that there's a, a reflecting pool behind the Washington Monument today, but there is not all of that water. That is the Potomac River, which used to come right on up to where the Washington Monument is. And uh, if you are familiar with Washington and the mall, how, you know the picture I just showed you showed the reflecting pool and the Lincoln Memorial at the end, you know that this has really changed over time, right? That the that how do we have all of that water there where today now we have we have land? Well, in the late 1800s, they're going to change this all around, and they're going to decide to fix this river up a little bit by making it deeper. And when you dig deep and you make the river deeper, you take what you've dug and you fill in the land. For someone like me, who who science is a little bit tricky for sometimes. I think of it about as, as being like a day at the beach and how when you dig a hole for a sandcastle and you dig your hole deeper, your hole gets deeper and all that dirt that you dug with your shovel to get that hole to be deeper now makes this big pile of sand so you can make your sandcastle. That's what they did with the Potomac River. They made it deeper and they filled in all that land so that now we have space to build a Lincoln Memorial. And there was actually some people at the time in the early 1900s who were very opposed to the idea of building a memorial to President Lincoln because they thought they were building it in what was sometimes referred to as a swamp. Because in this picture, we see the water. It wasn't always very deep. Um, and it made, um, made people uncomfortable at that, as some people uncomfortable about the idea that this was the spot to build Lincoln's memorial. But another side of this story was you've created this new land and there was nothing else out there. And they thought it was really important that if you're building this memorial to President Lincoln, it would be the only thing out there and people would have to make an effort to come all the way out and see it. 
So something else, if I have any folks who are living fairly local to Washington, DC, the thing you see beyond the river is the, the hills of Arlington, Virginia. And it is so funny today for those of us that live here and know that there's a lot of tall buildings on that hill today. Um, there's Arlington National Cemetery and Robert E. Lee's house across the river there. Um, to see it just so empty as it is in this picture is really, really amazing. So they'll fill in the land and they'll start working on this memorial to President Lincoln. This happens between 1914 and 1922. And understanding that the land was once part of the river helps us also understand why this foundation has to be so deep. This was somewhat, um, you know, unstable ground. And if you're building this really heavy memorial to President Lincoln, you want to make sure <laughs> that it's very sturdy. And so, um, a really deep foundation on this building. I find this picture to be really fun. Again, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how buildings are, are built, but I love seeing the columns that aren't finished and the pieces of the columns that are on the ground here. Um, there's a lot, lot going on here. Um, our Washington Monument, which we saw just a little while ago, unfinished, has finally been finished because now it's it's the early 1900s, and we're seeing how this was done. Amazingly enough, too, think about it 100 years ago with, with um, the technology that they would have had in that time as opposed to what we have today. So um, really uh, interesting to look at the old photos. And I also think um, when I look at this and I see that foundation, I think about um, those steps. When you go to visit the Lincoln Memorial and you have to climb up all those steps and maybe sometimes you're tired. I know a lot of you probably like to run up those steps. We really discourage that because we want to remember that we are at a memorial. Um, but as I try to take my old legs up these steps, um, it's, it's neat to think about that the reason we have so many steps is because of this foundation that goes deep underneath. And we hope in the future to be able to show um, a new museum. This door that you see right here is a door into a little exhibit area. Um, we hope in the future to, to revise that exhibit area and make it something really cool that you'll be able to enjoy the next time you come to visit. So 100 years ago, when they were building this memorial, they are thinking about President Lincoln, as a lot of you mentioned, president during the Civil War, and as being the person who was able to get the country back together. Of course, he didn't live too long to see the result of his efforts, but he fought hard for the unity of the country. And so we noticed that there are a lot of symbols in this building that relate back to the unity of the country. For instance, right up in front here, you can see the names of the states on this, um, we call it the freeze, this kind of uh, the spot on the roof of the building. There are 36 states in the country when President Lincoln was the president. And so for each one of those states, there are 36 columns around the outside of the building. So another way of kind of showing this idea of the unity of the country. There's another row of states, can't quite see them very clearly here, but just above this, the first row. And that's the 48 states that were in the country at the time that the, um, the memorial was finished in 1922. And so um, all 48 states at that time are on the top row of states. You may be wondering about the last two, right? Because we now have 50 states. Well, when they finally um, added those two states, Alaska and Hawaii in the 1950s, there was no more room left on the top row. And so they get a plaque down front as you walk on up towards these steps a little bit further off the picture here, but there's a plaque for Alaska and Hawaii because the unity of the country was so important to President Lincoln that he wouldn't want two states to not be included. So if ever we add some more states, we imagine we'll maybe have to think of another creative way to make sure we include them all here at the Lincoln Memorial. Something else that they thought about, which I know I never would have thought about, was the building materials that they used. They made sure that the rock represented in this building came from all parts of the country. There were six different states represented. Some were from the north, some were from the south. So when they said we built this building to represent our reunited country, they meant it. It was rock came from both north and south. And that was one way they could show kind of the unity of the country, even in its physical structure. So lots of different things went into the designing of this memorial, but all along these lines of unity. Even when we look at the statue of President Lincoln. So this 
um, statue was done by a gentleman named Daniel Chester French. He was a pretty famous sculptor of the, the time period. And he, um, he would work on this statue in his studio up in Massachusetts. And he made a smaller model of it and he brought it down to Washington to see how it looked in this big building. And it looked pretty tiny. And so he said, I guess I'm gonna have to make this a little bit bigger. And when he did that, he realized he wasn't gonna have a big enough piece of marble that could be as big as this statue. From his head to his toes, President Lincoln is 19 feet. And so he would end up having to carve this out of 28 different pieces of marble from Georgia that was used to build this statue. Now, Daniel Chester French doesn't do the actual carving himself. He makes his model and then he turns it over to a family of stone cutters. They're known as the Piccarelli brothers. And they were originally from Italy, but they moved to New York City in the 1800s, the 1880s. And just fascinating, I've been learning a lot about them lately. They were um, six brothers who all worked in this big stone carving um, uh, shop together. And they all worked on these different projects and they were responsible for carving the statue and bringing it to Washington and putting it all together. Here they are putting it all together. Um, I love this picture, it's one of my favorites. I'm sure you can all tell what part of the um, what part of the statue is missing in this picture. Um, and I believe that it's some of the Piccarelli brothers in the photo here helping to put it all together. And um, I just happened to notice, somebody asked about how much it cost. I think it's just under $3 million for the whole memorial. I think that's what it ends up being. Um, Daniel Chester French is the gentleman in the hat right down front. And so he's the one who sculpted this. And another interesting story I've recently found is that he, um, he had some help from some friends and one of his friends, um, someone he helped to teach about, stone, uh, about sculpting was a lady named Evelyn Beatrice Longman. And so she was asked to help do some of the designs near the speeches, which are on either side of the wall he, of, the, of the memorial. As you walk up the steps, you find his Gettysburg address on the left and you find his famous second inaugural address on the right. And underneath there are eagles and there are flowers and wreaths. And this lady was helping to, to work on the memorial. And it's just really interesting that behind this big, you know, memorial to President Lincoln, there are still a lot of these stories of people who helped that we really don't know a lot about. And so um, it's kind of neat to, to have the chance because I guess of this, big anniversary to be able to, to learn some more about all of these people and, uh, and this spectacular place. So yeah, this one's kind of uh, concerning, I guess, when you see President Lincoln without his head, but um, it, sure is, uh, it sure is a funny picture and makes us think about the process. Again, without the technology that we have, look at these guys having to pull up and put that hand together and eventually, of course, add his head. So um, that it might be a good time to see. Sure. Um, do you have any idea how heavy the memorial is? Or maybe oh gosh, just I have heavy. seen it. Oh gosh, it's tons and tons. I'll have to I'll have to get back to you. I don't know for sure how many tons, but I know it's a lot. And what about his hand? Is one of them closed? And is there a reason for that? Yes, indeed. There are a lot of there were a lot of what we call um, myths related to this to this um, memorial, and one of the popular stories that we hear people talk uh, about is the uh, idea that when you look at his hands, one is open and one is closed. Um, and yes, that is definitely done on purpose because we know that when uh, before President Lincoln died, he had um, both of his hands made of casts. And so they're both in fists. And so he very easily could have made both of them in fists based on models that they have of President Lincoln's hands. Um, but he went out of his way to make sure one of them was an open hand. And he did that because, um, we know he did that because he made a model of his own hand so he could make sure it looked realistic. And he wanted one to be open and one to be closed because the, the closed fist reminds us of this, the kind of the, um, the stress that he was under, the fact that he was president during this time of war and that it would have been really stressful to have um, you know, your, your fist clenched like that kind of reflects um, strength and then the stress of it all of being involved in this conflict. Whereas the open hand 
reminds us that President Lincoln had a very good sense of humor and he loved to tell jokes and he loved to be able to, um, you know, have his kids play with him even if he was in the middle of a meeting. And I don't know that all of his cabinet members appreciated it so much, but he would come in, uh, the kids would come in and play even if there was a meeting going on. And so we see kind of the, the two sides of the man, the fact that he was stressed out as, as president overseeing this wartime effort, but yet he also had um, a more um, kind of fun loving side to him. Yes, and so when I was talking about myths, <laughs> the, the myth that often comes up is the idea that his, his hands are in, in uh, making his initials in sign language, and I hate to be the, the, the buster of myths, um, but I'm pretty sure we have a letter from his daughter which says that the reason was the idea of the, the stress versus the not so stressed as opposed to um, it being about sign language. I want to point out one more symbol, or do you have another question for me? Yeah, along with symbols as well, someone was asking about the number of stairs leading up to the memorial and whether that has any significance. I'm not aware of any. Um, I know I kind of saw it alluded to recently online, um, but I'm not aware of any um, specific thing about the number of steps. I know that the memorial in Kentucky, where his log cabin is, is enclosed in a, in a building and the number of steps there reflect um, 56, the number of years that he lived, which was done on purpose. But I, um, I am not aware that the steps at the Lincoln have a significant number. It was about being able to get you up into the, the chamber so that you could see the statue. And I see Miss Rose's class has researched 38,000 tons for the weight of the statue. Is that the statue or is that the whole, um, the whole building. Um, goodness, so many questions, so many questions. Maybe we can come back to some if you wanna. I wanna point out one more symbol in, uh, in uh, this picture here that I love to point out because um, I think it's one that a lot of people don't know. And so I love to be able to share this. And I always think that it makes uh, great conversation uh, at the dinner table that you can show off tonight what you've learned today. Um, if, you, um, if you look at the thing, which this isn't the best picture to show you, but the thing draped behind the president's, um, the seated president, something draped behind him, does anybody know what that might be? Anybody wanna check that out and have a guess as to what might be draped behind the president's chair. Oh, I see some people got it. Yes. So in talking again about the idea of unity and symbols of our country, Daniel Chester French incorporated the idea of the American flag, the thing draped behind his chair. Another way of saying, you know, how important the unity of the country was um, in to, to, to President Lincoln and to this memorial. And so, yeah, a neat little symbol. When you come to visit, you have to look and see that uh, if you can get kind of standing by the side there and see if you recognize any things that would let you know it was the American flag, perhaps some stars or some stripes. Pretty hard to check, um, pretty hard to see, but make sure you look at it when you uh, come to visit us sometime. Let's see, did I put that in there again? So, the uh, memorial is built over the course of these years, 1914 to 22. And when they're finally done, they want to um, celebrate its opening with this dedication event. And so the dedication happened on May 30th, 1922. And so for the last year, I've been talking about what a big deal it's gonna be when May 30th, 2022 happens because this will be the 100th anniversary of the opening of the memorial. And so this is a photograph from the dedication day. And if y'all are interested in this and wanna learn some more, there is a seven minute video, which is available on the National Archives website that does not have any sound, but <laughs> will show you what it was like on the day of the dedication. So it's about seven minutes of footage and it shows the cars driving uh, up to the site and it shows people moving around and it's just really neat to see what it was like a hundred years ago as they were opening this building. So you can see hopefully in the background that there isn't a lot going on. 
and uh, you can uh, tell that the there's not a lot built up around. But this is the dedication day, and this was going to be a big deal for the folks who are opening up this building. And so we see some of the, the heavy hitters that day. The guy on the far left, this is uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. This is William Howard Taft. And he was president of the Lincoln Memorial Commission. And so he's part of the group that's going to um, be responsible for building. And so design and all of that, and this event, the dedication, all part of what he's responsible for. He is going to give a speech. He's gonna turn over the memorial to um, President Warren Harding. He's the president of the United States. He's the fella in the middle here. And so Warren Harding is gonna accept this memorial for the American people. Like, hey, I'm taking this now um, and accepting it for, for the country. But the people that everybody wanted to see on dedication day, this guy right here, this dude is Robert Todd Lincoln. This is President Lincoln's only surviving son at this point. And so he's in his late seventies. He lived a few more years, but he got to be there on the day of his father's memorial's dedication. Can you imagine being at the memorial that's being built to honor your father? And so Robert Lincoln is there. He did not give a speech. He just wanted to be there. And, and it's thought that he would have contributed a bit as the memorial was being built. He would have talked to Daniel Chester French on occasion and, and maybe offered up some suggestions about the, the statue and things that he liked or didn't like. Um, but he certainly wanted to be there and watch over this memorial as it was going up. So pretty neat uh, to see him there. So Taft would give a speech, Harding would give a speech. They would very much focus their speeches on this idea of unity that we owe this memorial to President Lincoln for all he did to help preserve the union. A lot of you, when you when I asked you about why a memorial to President Lincoln, a lot of you mentioned the idea of, of slavery and abolishing slavery. Um, the keynote speaker at the event that day was um, the president of Tuskegee Institute, a school down in um, Alabama, Tuskegee, yes. Um, and um, Dr. Moten is standing up on the step in this photo and he's giving his remarks. He was invited because they thought it would be a good idea to have someone um, representing the African-Americans at this event. But Dr. Moten had to share his speech with Chief Justice Taft before he gave it. And in fact, Taft said, you might wanna change a few things. He kind of claimed that it was a little bit too long, but what he was really worried about was, was um, Dr. Moten talking too much about civil rights because Dr. Moten sees this as a great opportunity. In 1922, there's still a lot of segregation happening. People are separated by what they look like. And Dr. Moten sees this memorial opening to President Lincoln, someone who helped to end slavery, sees this as a great opportunity to be able to talk about that. But the people planning this dedication ceremony don't wanna talk about that because as people came to this dedication ceremony, the audience is segregated. If you were African-American and you had a ticket, you would be directed to a separate section. And people were angry about that because that doesn't seem to stand with what President Lincoln represented, especially at this point in 1922. And so Dr. Moten has to kind of um, tweak his remarks. He has to say sort of what the committee wants him to say. And I guess it's that fine line where you have to think about, is it important to be represented and to speak there? Or is it more important to, to stand firm to what you really wanna say? And uh, Dr. Moten felt like he should be there to speak and, uh, and made his remarks fit the fit what people were wanting him to say. What's really interesting though, if you are someone who like us really interested in, in primary sources, the idea of, of the sources that tell the story from the from the person's you know personal view, we have both copies of Dr. Moten's speech, the original speech and the revised speech that he gave. You can find those both at the Library of Congress and on their webpage, and you can go and compare them yourself if you're someone who's really interested in doing that, or teachers, if you're looking for an activity to do, um, that's also something you might wanna consider really uh, interesting stuff. So we've looked at this memorial from its opening, and we've seen that it's very focused on unity. 
But yet so many of you today and many of the visitors who come to see the Lincoln Memorial today think of it as something that helps represent freedom to a lot of people. We get visitors from all over the world at the Lincoln Memorial and they're coming with this idea of freedom. And so how, after a hundred years, how has it changed? Like, how did it come from being, you know, all about unity to something that today um, represents freedom to a lot of people? I think we see it in the events that have happened there. And certainly this dedication um, kind of puts us off on a funny footing because here we are, it's not really uh, while we're celebrating Lincoln and this memorial, are we really celebrating freedom when people couldn't even sit in the, in the audience where they wanted to? Makes us think about how this sort of has changed, the meaning of this space has changed over time. And there have been some key events that have happened. I'm sure you all are familiar with some of them. One of my favorites to talk about is this lady, Miss Marian Anderson. She'll come and sing at the Lincoln Memorial on Easter Sunday of 1939. And this is a big deal because she had been denied the chance to perform at a nearby concert hall because of the color of her skin. And when she was denied the chance to sing at this building nearby, the idea was, well, maybe she can come perform outside somewhere. And then somebody said, you know, out here at the Lincoln, this is perfect. The feet of the great emancipator, this person who helped end slavery in this country, this is a perfect place. And so Miss Marion comes to perform. She's in front of an audience of 75,000 people. Look at the crowd all the way down the reflecting pool on this cold Easter Sunday evening. It was five o'clock when she started performing. Um, and all of these people, many more people than would ever have had the chance to see her perform in a concert hall, got to listen to her. And it didn't matter what you looked like. It didn't matter where you sat. Everybody was welcome to enjoy the music. And it's just a, a, a beautiful story of um, this Lincoln Memorial now being used as a stage. And I look at this photo with her and all those microphones. It meant that not only did the people there get to hear her, but people to, you know, also listening at home could hear. You can go to YouTube today and also hear her. She's got a, an amazing voice. She lived until the 1990s. She was like 90 something years old and um, a, a great talent. And as an aside, she eventually did get to perform at the concert hall down the street from us that denied her the chance back in 1939. But when you look at her and you see all these microphones and you see her um, uh, performing here, you realize the, the reach she had and, and a lot of people got to listen to her perform. And one of them was a young boy who was growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, who would have been about 10 years old at the time of this concert. And a few years later, when he gets to high school, he's gonna write an essay about this concert. It's gonna include a bit about this concert. And I don't mean for you to, to read all of this, but I wanted to just point out that in this essay, um, this is another example of a primary source. This is the essay that this young man wrote. And he's talking about Miss Marion's concert. She was barred from singing in the hall, but um, the nation rose in protest and gave um, this tremendous ovation. She got to stand on the steps at the Lincoln Memorial. And yet down at the bottom, that was a touching tribute, but Miss Anderson may not as yet spend the night in any good hotel in America. And in fact, the night of her concert at the Lincoln Memorial she had to go and stay with friends because she could not get a hotel room in Washington, DC. And what I love about this story, um, not that it happened, of course, but this quote from this young man's essay is that if you all haven't figured out, and I've got a pretty smart bunch here, I'm guessing you all know who wrote this essay, if you're interested in seeing if anybody has any thoughts about who might have written this essay. Um, the, uh, the young man growing up in Atlanta, Georgia is going to share this very same spot on the stage of the steps at the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah, y'all got it, of course. Dr. Martin Luther King, he's gonna stand on these steps in 1963 when he gives his very famous, I have a dream speech. Y'all are right on point there. Yes, exactly right. So Dr. King listening to Miss Marion's concert is gonna write about it in school one day. And it's, I don't know about you. Um, I, uh, I have a hard time imagining Dr. King. I think of him this way, giving these powerful speeches. And it's very hard to think of him as a young boy writing an essay in high school. But I think it also puts into perspective for us these historical figures that we have come 
to know even President Lincoln, larger than life, made out of a marble statue. You know, we don't think of them as, as young people. And here it is, Dr. King, a great example of that. I can't also see this picture without pointing out, of course, the park rangers. I hope you all notice park rangers in this photo because I just love to see park rangers there when uh, big historic moments are happening. And um, I'm sure you've all learned a lot about Dr. King, his March on Washington. Could do a whole program about that another time, but this is the crowd, 250,000 um, people come to, to participate in the March on Washington. It's an amazing day. Um, I think federal government, maybe even local government, a little concerned at the idea of all these people coming to Washington on this August day in 1963, but it turned out to be really peaceful and um, just a large demonstration of people coming together to say, we want jobs, we want freedom. And that's what this march was all about. And so um, we see this play out. This is a huge day at the Lincoln Memorial. It really reinforces this idea of, um, you know, uh, this being the scene of a stage, a place of, of demonstration where people are going to come now all the time to, to speak out for the things that, that are important to them. And we see many, many occasions. And I'd love to uh, encourage people when they come to visit to make sure you find the spot on the steps where Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech. And you can put your feet right there in that spot. And um, it's, uh, it's a really special, this is obviously an early morning picture. Um, not a lot of people, not a quarter of a million people there, but you can stand in that spot and think about what it would be like to share your dream with, uh, with all of the people who may be out there. And it's just, uh, you know, for a park where we focus so much on memorials and remembering people, to be able to stand in a spot where something happened is pretty, uh, pretty special. So that's one spot if you haven't, uh, when you come to visit the Lincoln, there are so many things you gotta look for. You gotta go find the flag now. You've gotta go find the spot where Dr. King stood when he gave his speech. Um, there's so much more history and I know we probably have a lot of questions and things. I'm not gonna go on here too much longer, but just a few more examples of, um, these are presidents who came to the Lincoln Memorial for different reasons. President Harry Truman is on the left. He's giving a speech as part of the um, closing conference for the National um, Association, National Association, um, NAACP. Of course, I'm gonna forget what it all stands for. National Association, yeah, hmm. I know it ends with colored people, but uh, there's an event the here that they're having. What, did you get it for me? <laughs> for the advancement. Advancement, thank you. Um, there it is, they're having, a, they're having their conference, the last day of their conference in 1947 here at the Lincoln Memorial. It's Eleanor Roosevelt sitting right here. Um, and Harry Truman is talking about how he's, uh, he's speaking on behalf of Americans. And when he says, Americans, he means all Americans. And it's uh, a pretty powerful speech that he gave there. Um, presidents have come for all different reasons. Gerald Ford, I think, is there on Lincoln's birthday on the right. We have a, a Lincoln's birthday ceremony there every year. And there's a, um, an interesting story about President Nixon. I think it's on our National Mall Facebook page today. Um, President Nixon, during the Vietnam conflict, got up in the middle of the night. He couldn't sleep, and he went to the Lincoln Memorial at 4 4 a.m. because he wanted to just come and, and be in, in, in this space. And he ended up um, talking to a bunch of folks who were um, protesting the Vietnam War. And so it's um, got so much history here, um, but from not just presidents and famous people who have come to the Lincoln, we have tons of things. We have movies that have been filmed here. There's all kinds of things, um, but everybody has their, their Lincoln Memorial story. Even Ranger Jen, when she first visited with her little brother, who now towers over her um, here, this must be the 1980s, early 80s, perhaps. Um, and I just wanted to use this as an example that it, it doesn't have to be the big famous people who, who have their moment at the Lincoln Memorial. This is a place that can speak to so many different people. And I sure hope that you all will have your chance to have your, your time at the Lincoln Memorial if you haven't already been there. Um, one last thing, um, and I will stop talking and see if we have some questions. It appears there may be some. Um, we've got this quote that was carved above the statue of President Lincoln, um, you know, and it's talking again. Um, this was done, of course, by 1922. So it's referring to um, 
you know, in this temple as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the union. We're talking again about the union. The memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. And that's what this was all about, this idea of, of unity. And I wonder um, what you all think, if unity is really what this memorial means to you. And we've thought about this a lot. Um, also on this slide is a newspaper article that comes from June of 1922, so about 100 years ago, that claims, this is a newspaper known as the Chicago Defender, it's a, an African-American paper, that claims this, is, um, this memorial may be opened, but it's not dedicated because of the way it was handled, the fact that the audience was segregated, that, that Dr. Moten maybe didn't get to say what he wanted to say, um, it remains undedicated. And that maybe someday we need to come up with a way with song, prayer, bold and truthful speech, with faith in God and country, later on, let us dedicate the temple thus far only open. So I wanted to throw this out here as some ideas for y'all to think about. And um, we also wondered, um, my colleagues and I, do we think that after learning a little bit about the history of this memorial, do we think that the words above Lincoln's head do a good job and should stay there? I mean, we're not gonna ever probably change anything because memorials don't usually get changed. But if you had the opportunity to say something different, would you change those words above Lincoln's heads above Lincoln's head. And if so, you know, what would, what would, do you think maybe it should say, if not those words? And um, I throw that out there because I think it's kind of fascinating to think about, like what, what should that say? And, and there was controversy a little bit. Um, the artist who, or the, the person who wrote these words um, was an art critic from New York City. And he said he, he chose to focus on unity and to not mention Lincoln and slavery because he said he didn't wanna upset people in other parts of the country. He said it was just easier not to mention it because this would just keep everybody happy. And so I wonder if you all have thoughts about this and if anybody wants to uh, take on that challenge, um, here's, uh, here's, here's some more info. This is um, our logo for the, the 100th of the Lincoln Memorial. It's where you can find me if you feel so inclined, our websites and um, our Twitter, Facebook, I think is, at National Mall NPS. Erin, if you wanted to contact her, is at the National Mall. And if you feel so inclined and want to share some, uh, some thoughts or ideas you might have about any of this, uh, any of this we'd be happy to, to, to hear your suggestions. And so I will, I will stop talking and see if uh, folks have any questions. Again, thank you all so much for joining us today. And um, we'd love to hear from you. If you have more questions, feel free to, to reach out, check out our website, um, contact us on, on social media or email. Yeah, we do have a lot of questions for you, Jen. Um, but I okay. wanted to share this quote from Ms. Barclay's first grade class in Washington, DC. They say, in community, we find unity in response oh, to the quote on the memorial. Um, so we have a lot of questions about size and weight and cost. So I just pulled up some numbers to share with everyone. Um, the height of the full building is 79 feet and 10 inches. Okay. Um, the weight of the full building, 38,000 tons. So someone did pull out that stat for us, but that's of the full memorial, 38,000 tons. The statue, let's see, we had the weight there. Um, as I'm looking, okay, I'll come back to that. The total cost of the memorial, $3,045,400. Um, pretty massive. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see what questions we have for you. One question was how long did it take the memorial to be built? So are you talking, do you think just the statue? Um, the three million is is then that the cost of yeah. of it, yeah. Then, um, so they start building in for, 1914 and they finish it in 22. Um, the statue is not nearly that long because um, the statue's done I think a little bit before. Um, and again, I, you know, not as, as, as drastic as the Washington Monument, but World War I goes on during the beginning of this. And so there's, I think a little bit of a break. 
And um, there, there, there's always some kind of politics when different administrations are in, are in power, things sometimes tend to slow down um, based on, you know, we don't think of maybe Lincoln, everybody seems to wanna take responsibility and, and claim President Lincoln, but I think that there, are, um, this was definitely a, a project um, that the Republicans were very uh, focused on getting done. And so there's, um, yeah, I mean, how long did it actually take? I, uh, you know, I know it's 14 to 22 and which part were they, um, they working on? Uh, I, I just know that's, that, that's the time frame they were working on it. I did find the weight of the statue, it's 120 tons for those wondering. Um, oh, goodness, these folks are very into details. I'm so impressed. Oof. Speaking, let's see, we have another myth. You can tell us if it's true or not. Miss Monaco has heard that you can see the artist's face on the back of Lincoln's head. Is that true? Well, that's a new one actually that I've not heard the artist before. Um, so usually what we hear is that when you look at Lincoln's, you know, from the back and you, you, you stand by the side of him and you look to see the back, um, we often hear that it looks like uh, <laughs> Robert E. Lee's head. Um, that's usually what we hear. We've, I've heard Ulysses S. Grant. I've not heard the artist before, but that's interesting. I will share with you something new. And, and um, I, <laughs> I, um, I've worked here over 20 years. And um, I'm surprised that I can still be learning new things. It's really exciting. Um, but I found, actually one of the students on a, on a field trip with me a few weeks ago found French, uh, Daniel Chester French, his last name carved into the bottom of the statue by the Lincoln chair. And so now I know where French's name is on the, the statue, um, which is very exciting. I have never heard that French was the face carved into the back. And quite honestly, I don't see it. I, you know, I just see his hair. Um, but you know, the beauty of these memorials is that they are opened, um, you know, for interpretation and people can see different things. And I, I don't happen to see that. I don't know that that was ever intended to be seen, but that's one of those things. We had a question asking how many people showed up to the dedication event. Oh, great. Really quizzing you today. <laughs> I feel like it was a pretty big crowd. I want to say it was in the um, the fifty. I want to say it was fifty thousand, but I maybe um, I may be getting that completely wrong. Um, I feel like it what was about, a pretty good crowd. What about today? How many people visit the Lincoln Memorial on an average day? I, I don't. I don't think there is such a thing as an average day. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Um, we do know. We we claim the Lincoln Memorial is the most visited of the memorials on the National Mall. And we say visitation to the mall is about 34 million a year. So I don't know that we can divvy it up by, um, by day, but um, you know, a spring day, I tell you, a Friday during the springtime in Washington, there are days where um, I, I do school programs and I've walked up the steps with a group of kids and they're all in matching yellow t-shirts or whatever. And I get up to the top and I I turn around and I can't tell which is my group and which is somebody else's group because there are just so many students um, all over the place. Um, so it can be very busy on a spring day. My goodness, we've got so many questions I see popping in. Um, I saw one about asking about the memorial being destroyed, which was um, I just something I would like to, to jump in on because um, Oh, thank you. 35,000 for the dedication. Okay, excellent. I'll take that. Um, part of our job as the National Park Service is to care for very special places. And we do that with the help of a group like the Trust for the National Mall. Um, but it's really important to us that we take care of these places, not just for ourselves, but because they belong to the American people. The, the National Parks belong to all of you. And that's, um, that's something we take really seriously. And we have people in different jobs. So my job is to educate and be able to share with people the stories so that you wanna come and visit and that you wanna learn more about it. And you wanna be someone who's gonna help take care of it and not do something destructive while you're there. Um, it's very important to us to do that. And we have people who are trained on how to take care of the marble or to um, make sure things don't happen. Um, so it's something we take very seriously and, and we're, um, yeah, we're very, we're very much 
um, a big part of it. It's not just about talking about it, it's about physically taking care of it too. And a student from Ms. Georgina's class wants to know if you personally, Jen, feel proud of this memorial. And there were also questions about how do you know so much? So maybe how did you become to uh, being a ranger? Oh, goodness. Um, so I got interested in being a ranger because I loved history and I love history um, going back to my fifth grade teacher. It was my fifth grade teacher way back, way back when, who got me really excited about it. And I wanted to go and be in those places and see where these things happened. And so that was really important to me. And I mean, I consider myself really lucky that I get to be someone who goes to work every day and actually likes doing what I do. I get to talk about history. I mean, that's, that's a pretty cool job. And I get to share my love of something with other people to hopefully get them interested. And I get to be in these places where, where things like the, the march or the concert or the memorial to President Lincoln, where they are. Um, so that's pretty, pretty big, uh, big deal for me. Um, I've been here a long time. And so you learn things over time. I, I often will say, you know, how many times have you all asked me questions that I didn't know the answers to even today? I'll have to go back and, and figure it out. And when someone asks you a question and you don't know the answer, um, you're much more likely to remember it now. <laughs> maybe, maybe the tons I won't remember. But um, <laughs> oftentimes when you get asked a question that you don't know the answer to, you will go and, and figure it out. And that's what, um, that's what helps me learn a lot, I think, that I have to answer questions. And so um, little by little, it's not something you learn all at once, but little by little, you, you retain some of this. We have some questions about just visiting the Lincoln Memorial. What does it cost to visit it? And what artifacts and displays might they see if they went into the undercroft? And if you can give any um, details about what might be under there. I don't know if you're allowed to share that. Um, and how long you've worked there as well. Oh, well, I've been here since 1998. So I don't know, my math's not very good. I think that's 20 uh, something years. Um, yeah, I saw a question asking about what's inside. So um, the inside of, of what we call the chamber is the room where, where the Lincoln statue is. When you walk up the stairs, see that statue and it was done that way on purpose. So you would focus on that statue to the left is um, a chamber with just the carving of the Gettysburg Address on the wall. And above the wall is a mural that was painted way back um, around the time it opened um, by a fellow named Jules Guerin. He did two murals. There's one above each of the speeches. So on the left side is the Gettysburg Address. The right side is the second inaugural. And above, um, above the, the, the Gettysburg Address, oh golly, I think is the Emancipation Mural. And so it's the only real, only real reference to emancipation at all in the memorial. They were so focused on unity, and um, that you know that they they at least put this mural in there. But it's way up high above the Gettysburg Address. And the second mural is called Reunion, and it's um, each of them feature in the center like this kind of very classical design of an angel of truth. Um, in the reunion, it's joining the North and South together. And in the emancipation, it's, it's the, the angel of truth with her arms up as if to free the slaves. Um, so those are the things that you see inside the building. Um, the underneath is uh, a little exhibit mainly focused on quotes of Lincoln's and then some um, references to events that have happened there, a lot of the different things over the years. Um, but it's pretty... Um, it's getting to be pretty outdated. And so they're really looking to um, really looking to um, revise it and, and do a whole new kind of uh, much more interactive exhibit and give you the chance to see into that foundation, what we refer to as the undercroft, the space underneath the Lincoln Memorial, that big foundation we looked at from outside. You can also see inside. It's not an area that's opened to the public to be able to look at. Um, or to go into today, it's a safety and security issue, um, but it's got some, uh, you know, it's got some old, old um, fe features to it. It's got these stalactites or stalagmites, the things that drip down, and it's got some historic graffiti, the, the carvers, the workers on the building, um, 
did uh there's all kinds of like cartoons and graffiti and things that they wrote and they're hoping that in the future they'll be able to redo the exhibit so that you'll be able to have a wall a glass window that lets you look out into that space and see a little bit more of that can't wait i know it's pretty cool and so everyone knows it is free to visit the lincoln memorial oh, and yes, you definitely. can come at any time any day <laughs> I see uh, the dream spot added. That was nine, that was 2003. It was the 40th anniversary of the I have a dream speech when that was added. And I actually remember that I was here for that. And um, Mrs. King was still alive. And I remember seeing photos of her watching the carving of the spot on the step happen and her children were there too. And so that was, uh, that was a neat thing. The memorial, I see a question about the rock. The, the statue is Georgia marble. The building is, is Colorado Yule marble. There's some Indiana limestone in some of the columns. There's some Massachusetts granite on the steps. Tennessee, the pink marble is the floor and the, um, I think the, the pedestal part, I think that's also Tennessee. And then there's something from Alabama and I just am forgetting where it is, but there's six states represented in the rock. So I'm impressed only that I can remember all that because that's bordering awfully close to science, which I don't do very well. Someone else asked if there's anything carved into the memorial and they gave the example of the broken chain on the Statue of Liberty. Hmm. That one, thing that I, one thing that I did learn from one of our past sessions is that you can see a fossil on the inside chamber of the memorial in that limestone. As soon as you go in and look to the right on that wall there, if you're looking yep. very closely, you can find a small fossil. And it's not something that I like to call attention to, but people always ask us about the misspelled word that's in the second inaugural address that if you were, um, um, that if you look to the, there's three kind of panels for the, the second inaugural and the very first column about two thirds of the way down, um, there was uh, a word carved, the word carved was future, but the artist sculpted or carving it used, apparently used the wrong stencil is what I heard recently is that instead of an F used an E and then had to kind of fill in for the, the bottom line of the E for the, for the F on future. So um, feel free to check that out sometime on the second inaugural side. We're getting close to time, but I like okay. this question. One of my fourth graders wonders, what inspired Lincoln to run for president? So it was, um, he had been in Congress in the late 1840s. And um, goodness. I think he was he was concerned about where things were going. And I think um, I don't know. I would I would venture to guess he probably, you know, wasn't even sure that he would <laughs> he would be that successful. There were quite a few other people running at the time. And there was this kind of um, you know, there was not a lot of support for Lincoln, particularly in the South. And so um, yeah, that's a good question. I would think that Lincoln would have wanted to, to, to make things better. And I think, I think we could look to a lot of his speeches that he gave um, during the, the debates with Douglas and with the, um, some of the speeches he gave right before the election. And um, I think you could get a better, I, I mean, I think you could just read from his words to see what it is he had to say. And off the top of my head, I haven't read a lot of the speeches in a long time of that era, but I bet we could, if we go back to those words, we could find what it was that motivated him. Oh my gosh, lots of good questions. Well, it sounds like everyone has more questions that you've inspired some additional learning and everyone can go take advantage of all of the Lincoln 100 programs being offered by the Park Service. If you go to um, that website linked here on Jen's slide, you can 
explore much more about Lincoln and the memorial and his presidency um, and maybe attend an event or two in person if you're nearby. Thank you all so much for, for joining us. Um, yeah, if there's anything else we can do, I, I focus on education. So I'm happy to continue the conversation. If there's anything um, else we can do for you, please, uh, yeah, please check out our web pages and um, let us know if there's anything else we can help you with. Thank you, Aaron, again, for hosting us. It's always a pleasure working with you. And um, so nice to have so many of you uh, join us today and hope you have a chance to visit the Lincoln Memorial, if not, if not, maybe this month, at least sometime in the future. So thank you all so much. Thanks, everyone. And thanks so much, Ranger Jen. Thanks.